Well, good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. This is Tavio Akimasko here, and we are doing the Implementation Science for Innovation and Discovery monthly session. We moved it from 5 p.m. to or 4 p.m. to noon time, so hopefully more people are able to attend. We're also recording it, and it will be available on the CPSI website as usual. Um, I will be presenting today about a topic that came up actually in one of the previous sessions. One of our guest speakers mentioned the book called The Fusion of Innovations. And I thought that's actually a good idea to go back to the basics and a little bit of the history of um, the fusion of innovation, implementation science, and, and uh, kind of give some examples of how innovation diffuses in the environment and hopefully we'll have some good time at the end for uh, Q&A. So I thought I would start out with a couple of quotes. The first one says, there is nothing more difficult to plan, more doubtful of success, nor more dangerous to manage than the creation of new order of things. Whenever his enemies have the ability to attack the innovator, they do so with the passion of partisans, while the others defend him sluggishly so that the innovator and his party alike are vulnerable. Anybody wants to, to venture who said this? Steve Jobs. Oh, similar, Nicola Machiavelli <laughs> in 1513. <laughs> So I thought I would actually jump right, right into a, another example, how the refrigerator got its hump. So every house refrigerator nowadays has a motor which drives the compressor that condenses a liquid, releasing the heat into the surrounding environment, which the liquid had previously absorbed inside the refrigerator when the liquid vaporized. And that's the principle of cooling apparently in electrical refrigerators. A, interestingly enough, I found out looking for different things that there is actually a superior alternative to the electrical type, which is the gas refrigerant, in which ammonia refrigerant is vaporized by hitting it with a gas flame. Later, the refrigerant dissolves into water, this cooling the refrigerator box. The gas refrigerator has no moving parts, so it is very unlikely to break, and it does not make any noise. Now, you may say, how about gas? You know, do you need to have a pipe? No, actually, the initial models were with propane tanks, and they don't even have to be that big, but they're completely noiseless, and they don't break so easily. So interestingly, in about 1930s, both prototypes were developed by different companies. And given what I told you about, plus the fact that overall, if you just average out over decades, gas is typically cheaper than electricity, it makes sense that the gas refrigerator captured the market, right? No, it didn't. Anybody wants to venture why? Could you hear it work? <laughs> Too terrible. So was it the, the hum, the lack of hum, not knowing if it's working or not? But it turns out that there was very extensive research and development put in by different big companies, such as General Motors, General Electric, Combinator, and Westinghouse. And these companies decided that larger profits can be made out of the electrical refrigerators. So they put all their resources into the research for the electrical ones, and they very aggressively promoted that with their, their power. Several smaller companies making gas refrigerators could not compete and they went out of business essentially. So the technology available to the consumer still today was shaped by the corporate profitability rather than the consumer's choice. As such, the refrigerator with the hump prevailed and diffused in the marketplace. I, I can make a side note about this, that this goes to the social dimension of uh, implementation or what do you adopt and what do you put efforts as a society or as a system in implementing since they could be perverted incentives that could uh, lead to adoption or other options. So I, I looked up gas refrigerators online. So I found this front, it looks very similar to the electrical ones. And it had a very extensive, it's, it's interesting that it's in a, in, a, in a store there with a lot of background stuff, but it has all the components. And you can see the small tank there with gas, 
and there is a burner in the bottom here that shows uh, the flame and how the, the, the system works. And of course, there is still a niche market. I didn't think about this before, but this <laughs> the fridger, gas refrigerator is actually advertised for local Amish families. And I didn't know about this either, that they like a lot of the ice cream because they said it can hold several gallons of ice cream. Um, the more interesting part is that it does provide a five-year warranty. So it does go together with not moving parts. So it may be a little bit more a lasting more and uh, a company that makes it can afford a longer work. Now, I did want to indoctrinate you with this slide that includes only this information on it and re remind you if you are in previous sessions or tell you right now that this is the fate of innovation in medicine. It takes on average nowadays 17 years to be adopted and only 14% according to the latest studies we have, make it. Now, you may have seen this curve and the blue curve is really the one I'm talking about, which is the Gauss curve, the normal curve. And the yellow one is really the cumulated probabilities. But somebody has, has come up with this system where the marketplace is divided in a normal Gaussian curve by dividing individuals who are innovators about 2.5%, early adopters about 15.5%. This goes with standard deviations. Early majority will get basically to the medium. There is a late majority, another third of people after that. And the laggards are really the very late adopters and people 2.5% will probably never adopt. And they will be called laggards. Anyone knows who came up with this concept first? I don't think so, don't worry about it. <laughs> Everett Rogers, the author of Diffusion of Innovations. In the first edition in 1962, had five editions. In fact, the, the last one was in 2003. It was still called the fifth edition, but it was significantly modified, included a more uh, modern topics and looked at the impact of the internet. So this is actually a landmark uh, publication in the field of diffusion of innovation. So Everett Rogers died in 2004. Um, he became a famous American communication theorist and sociologist who developed the actual theory of diffusion of innovations and introduced the term early adopter from the curve I showed you on the slide before. He was born in Carroll, Iowa in 1931. So I'll give you a little bit of his early life uh, and upbringing. His father was a farmer. He loved electromechanical farm innovations. And at that time, I should mention, the federal government was really trying to push innovation in the field of agriculture so that <coughs> to ensure that everybody is fed. Um, and he was at the same time very resistant, his father, to biochemical innovations. He resisted adopting the new hybrid seed core, which was advertised and pushed strongly by the government, local and, and federal. And despite the fact that this hybrid core was actually producing 25% more yields in crop and was more resistant to drought and actually even disease. So his father in 1936 saw how his, his seed corn stood, uh, the, the, the neighbors, uh, the, the hybrid seed corn stood tall on the, on the farm while his was with so he was finally convinced. So it took a little bit of comparison with the peers, I guess, uh, but he was very resistant at first. So Ed Rogers, he had no plans at that time to attend university. Uh, and he describes in his book how uh, uh, he was lucky that one of the uh, school teachers decided to take him and his schoolmates uh, to Iowa State University in Ames. Um, and after that, he was really convinced that she should go for a college degree. So he actually went for a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture at Iowa State University that he got in 1952. After that, he went to Korea to, to the Korean War for two years. And then he returned to the same institution where he got a PhD and a Master's of Science, both in rural sociology. And after that, he became a very successful academician in these fields. Uh, he was faculty at Ohio State, at Michigan State, at the University of Michigan. 
uh, became professor of international communication at Stanford and then professor and associate dean at the University of Southern California and the School of Communication. Then he became a Fulbright lecturer where he taught also at the National University of Columbia in Bogota and the University of Paris in France. Um, he became the president of the International Communication Association and fellow for, of the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. In 1933, he was recruited by University of New Mexico to create this uh, new department as chair, Department of Communication and Journalism, and he launched a doctoral program in communication with a special emphasis in cross-cultural and intercultural contexts for, for journalism, for communication. Uh, he authored more than 30 books and more than 500 articles. So when, when the first edition of the Diffusion of Innovations was published in 1962, Rogers was an assistant professor in rural sociology at Ohio State University. He was only 31 years of age and he was already well known internationally. Um, in the mid 2000s, the Diffusion of Innovations, which was in his fifth edition now, became the second most cited book of all social sciences. Uh, in the fifth edition in 2003, he addressed the spread of the internet and how that transformed the way human beings communicate and how people adopt new ideas. I guess we would need another edition about miscommunication and misinformation yes. and that, but fortunately, he's not. Uh, his research and work became widely accepted in communications and technology adoption studies and also found its way into a variety of other social science studies. Uh, he was able to relate his communications research to practical health problems. So he actually even used his diffusion of innovation in public health, general hygiene, family planning, uh, clean water in Egypt or in Peru, uh, in other places in, in uh, Colombia, uh, cancer prevention, public health measures, and also campaigns against drunk, uh, drunk driving. So he was the one, as I mentioned earlier, who came up with this uh, adoption curve that we may be familiar from other fields, where he decided that innovators are typically 2.5% of the, the normal distribution, early adopters about 13.5, you get the early majority another third, and that's where you're at median, and then the late majority and laggards after that. Um, so he really created with these terms, innovators, early adopters, late adopters, a common, common language, common terminology for innovation researchers later on. Um, now, he also mentioned in his uh, publications that willingness and ability to adapt and to adopt an innovation depends on awareness, interest, evaluation of that particular innovation. A lot of times trial and error, people want to try it. And then finally, the, the phenomenon of adoption. And people can fall into different categories for different types of innovations. And he gives the example, his father, we didn't want to use the, the chemical innovations, but he was more for the tractors and the new mechanical innovations. Um, he also gives in his book, the nice example of people may be very uh, well uh, accepting some innovations, but completely reject VCRs, for example. Now don't ask me what VCRs are. I know we're already past a couple of decades there. Um, so I'll give you a few quotes from Ev Rogers. He says, getting a new idea adopted, even when it has its obvious advantages is difficult. So the, the gas refrigerator story, I guess. Many technologists, so people from technology, I should say, believe that advantageous innovations will sell themselves, that the obvious benefits of a new idea will be widely realized by potential adopters, and that innovation will diffuse rapidly. Tell them this is the case. This is actual growth. Many innovations require a lengthy period of many years from the time when they become available to the time when they are widely adopted. Remember? 17 years. Therefore, a common problem for many individuals and organizations is how to speed up the rate of diffusion of an innovation. And then I think he was very uh, instrumental in making these. Um, Fields very clearly defined and common language they use by different research, uh, diffusion uh, researchers. One is diffusion, which is the process by which an innovation is communicated. So we're talking about innovation, communicated through certain channels. That's extremely important. 
over time and what period of time that can vary very based on the different type of innovation. And in a specific social system, it is a special type of communication in that messages are concerned with the new ideas, with the new innovation. And then the communication, he defines it as a process by which participants create and share information with one another, being a two-way process of convergence. He's emphasizing that a lot in his publications in order to reach a mutual understanding common kind of language. Shifting gears, give you a very close up of the lemons here. And I know it's lunchtime, it's not intended for salivary gland stimulation, but it's more of a test. I mean, this is the usual medicine test. You see an image and you should have a left hemispheric reaction of what that is related to. What, what's the first thing that ends it in your mind? Smell, I can smell them. So olfactory memory, anything <laughs> else? Taste. Taste, okay. I'm very glad I haven't heard this one. <laughs> it would be actually wrong, right? Because there's supposed to be lime there, not lemon in the in the cerveza and the corona. Um, does anybody know the story of how this became a thing? I heard that a few years ago, and it, it turns out there was a college student who was uh, taking a summer job at a bar. And he was bored. There were not a lot of people you know, buying during the day there on the beach. And he came up with this idea. And what he said to his friends, look, I'm gonna try something new and I bet people will start imitating me and do the same thing. And that's what he came up with. He put a slice of lemon into the, into, um, into the, and he didn't have any idea why he would do that. It could be more tasteful, or, but it spread like fire. <laughs> people started to do it the same day and it became a thing to the point where the beer company was trying to get in touch with him to find out who he was and they never figured it out. But it became a thing. It spread very fast. And you cannot find a lot of rational reasons for that, right? What I was hoping that you would actually have a reaction to you can tell me about that lemons have this sour taste. You did mention it. And it's because of the citric acid and a little bit of the malic acid. The malic acid is really very little. It has the, the, the typical lemon has about five to six percent uh, in contents uh, of the juice in, in citric acid. Um, so the lemons contain about 50 milligrams to 100 milligrams of, 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 of vitamin C of citric acid, ascorbic acid, I'm sorry, um, which is actually about the same amount as the oranges, less actually in limes. So I thought I would, I would actually divagate again and then go a little bit about the, the story of scurvy and a couple of important investigators in, in the field. So in the early days of long sea voyages, scurvy actually killed more sailors than did warfare, accidents, and other causes altogether. For example, in Vasco da Gama's crew of 160 people, men, who sailed around the Cape of Good Hope in 1497, a hundred of them died of scurvy. It was a pretty devastating disease. One British expedition that was geared towards raiding the Spanish holdings in the Pacific Ocean in 1740s lost 1,300 people out of the, out of the original 2,000 men to this specific illness. And I found a commander that said about this disease, this is how he described it, that it almost kills the entire crew, as a luxuriancy of fungus flesh, putrid gums, and the most dreadful terrors and it was called the Sailor's Curse, scurvy. Nobody knew at that time that it was called by vitamin C deficiency, which was really discovered or called like that in 1930. So the first clinical trial really that this is described, is actually that of James Lancaster. And James Lancaster was an English sea captain who in 1601 was, was going with four ships from England to India. And he realized at some point during his travels that if you gave fresh fruit to the men on the, on the ship, you can prevent scurvy. But in order to document that observation, he conducted an experiment. And he served 
three teaspoons of bottled lemon juice every day to the sailors on the Red Dragon, the ship where he was on, and, and, the, uh, and left the other three ships as controls. And what he discovered that on the control ships, out of 278 sailors, about 110 died of scurvy by the midpoint of their journey, to the point that he had to take part of his crew from the Red Dragon to put it back on the, on the control uh, uh, ships for them to continue the journey. And what he did, he documented his study very well and sent it to the Admiralty. And the results were so clear that one would have expected, of course, that the British Navy would start offering citrus juice for scurvy prevention on all ships right away, right? Actually not. Now, when do you think the next thing happened in this field was 146 years later, in 1747, when another captain, another English captain called James Lynn, he was a Scottish Navy physician. He was actually well aware of Lancaster's results of his initial clinical trial on Her Majesty's ship Salisbury. He conducted another experiment. He realized that he had two scurvy patients on his ship. And what he did, he divided them up randomly and he prescribed either two oranges and one lemon or one of the following five controlled treatment supplements. Half a pint of seawater. I don't know how those people reacted to that. Six spoons of vinegar, a quart of cider, nutmeg, and the last group got 25 drops of vitriol elixir. Vitriol is sulfuric acid. Again, they don't mention how they, they behaved uh, to that, but it was diluted, it was probably with sugar, but still, it's vitriol. The scurvy patients who got lemons and oranges were cured within a few days and were able to help Dr. Lind care of the patients from, from the ship who actually were, were on the other treatments. Unfortunately, he ran out of lemons and oranges in six days. So he sent a report to the Admiralty. And how do you think they reacted? They did nothing for the next 48 years. It was in 1795 when the British Navy, the military British Navy, decided that they need to send every sailor with a scurvy preventable measure, which is lemons. Now, it's interesting that there was about a century of back and forth. Uh, and, and the back and forth and the uncertainty about how these, how the scurvy can be treated with lemons was due on one hand because the scurvy was not a uniformly presenting disease and not everybody developed it in the same way, so it was capricious. Um, but also the, the how much vitamin C was in the lemon. So at some point, because the limes were cheaper, uh, they actually resorted to use limes and not everybody actually got better or not everybody was prevented to develop scurvy. It was actually at the point where the US colonists were, were calling the British limings because they were using limes in their ships. But it was still a time where a lot of people had significant um, uncertainty and they were not convinced that this is actually the reason of scurvy. They were hope they were actually believing that there is some type of contamination in this scurvy. And then it took another 70 years in 1865 when the British Board of Trade adopted a universal uh, policy that all ships, uh, civilian, merchant, or, or uh, military to have this measure. And I found this uh, nice painting of Dr. James Lind administering uh, lemons to the scurvy patients. You can see actually the TKI on their legs. So I thought there was some nice, interesting uh, medical part to that. I don't know if he was using one lemon per person, probably he wouldn't have enough. So I want to ask how he was going from one patient to another one. <laughs> but I found also this interesting book, which is called The Disease of Discovery. And the, the name, the title is Curve. And you see C from vitamin C there. So any comments, questions, additions to this uh, journey that I took on the slide about how one Did you find a ton of difference between the vitamin C and in in the various fruits? Is it, does it vary that much? Like lemons have have limes have it? No, lemons don't. So so limes don't have as much. They have much less. They have about half. So if fifty to one hundred milligrams of ascorbic acid is in a lime, usual size uh, lemon, then lime will have about half. 
oranges have about the same as, as, as uh, lemons. My question about the lack of early adoption was the availability of citrus fruits. And if we're talking about Britain, once they're away from Britain, they can probably pick them up at home and they're really available and then they'll the lie me. So could yeah, yeah. Did the book did and, anything comment on just lack of availability of citrus fruits? I think this book uh, talks a little bit more about the fact that um, they, they purposefully created uh, stops uh, in South Africa or Namibia where they would actually get some provisions of, uh, of limes or, or lemons. But you're right, there was a scarcity, right? And cost was a significant part. But we're talking here about the British Navy uh, and they were losing lots of people to this terrible disease, right? Were there any religious or, um, well, let's say religious belief systems that involved certain patients are cursed or something. Because um, I find in other settings, sometimes difficult to explain behavior that may have religious roots. I have not seen that, but it's possible. And I think you're getting to something very important, which is norms, right? What, what's the, the set of beliefs and norms of a specific social group? And how do, could that actually prevent the adoption of innovation or... Well, and you mentioned that they attributed scurvy to other contaminations. Right. I mean, were they legitimate concern, uh, you know, contaminations or were they kind of magical thinking contaminations? I mean, there must have been other hardships on board ships that... So it was a, a very... Reasonable theories. Very non-scientific times, I guess, right? And, and very interesting things. So, so people noticed that rats don't develop scurvy. But rats have a, have a biologic mechanism of actually producing ascorbic acid. And there was a time, I'm sorry some people are eating here, <laughs> but there was a time when people were treating scurvy with eating the rats from the ships and they were getting rid, rid of the disease. <laughs> so so all day. kind of you know, weird beliefs, right? <laughs> Got a question. Yes. Yeah, I was just gonna say that uh... I guess with Lancaster and Lind, it was uh, unfortunate that they didn't have data safety monitoring committees. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and of course, they would stop those trials. <laughs> that the studies were not blinded either. There's a lot of cross, uh, you know, of uh, sailors from one ship to another one, from one group to another one. Yeah. Anyway, um, let me take you to a different example here, which is the. QWERTY versus the Dvorak keyboards for computers. And it starts with a typewriter. So the typewriters were invented in the early 1800s. And the keyboard was laid out in an alphabetical order with piano-like keys. And then the modern typewriter was actually devised by Christopher Scholes, who had this type of design. So you see the, the digits on the left side and the letters on the right, and they go in alphabetical order. The first row and the second row continues there. So that was considered at that time the best layout for, for the keys. Uh, and because the key hammers did not have a spring-loaded mechanism, they required gravity to come back after they were hit. And if you hit in short succession two neighboring keys at, at very near, nearby, they would not have the time to come back and they would jam. So what Scholes did, he devised a system that you would have the lowest probability of hitting two neighboring keys in the usual words that were typed. In other words, he devised the QWERTY keyboard that has Q, W, E, R, T, Y, or we all know this uh, keyboard in order to slow down people so that they don't hit two adjacent <laughs> keys. Now, don't you find it interesting that we still have this keyboard? But you may say, well, well what's the alternative, right? So the, this layout, as I said, was actually devised with that specific purpose, to slow you down and not to have to, to, to hit two different keys that were adjacent. And because typing was slow, then they would actually have very regimented lessons for the typists that would go and then train and, and try to teach from hunt and peck technique to the touch typing. Uh, and then in the early 1900s, typists were becoming very proficient, very fast. Now, August Dvorak in 1936 
he had apparently a passion about studying keyboard layouts and typing. So he had a, an experience of about 11 years. He did a study over 11 years. And he thought that he can actually improve the QWERTY format of the, of the keyboard, Shaw's uh, keyboard. And he came with his own called Vorax Simplified Keyboard. And he placed the vowels on the middle portion very, very close to the left hand. And then T, H, and S on the right hand side for the right hand. And he somehow devised a system where he tested what's the likelihood of, of typing a specific text with different combinations and he kept rearranging this. And he said, this is better. And as proof, he actually trained typists. He was in the Navy. He tried typists on the Navy base where he worked and sent these typists around the world to participate in typing competitions. And they always won. They were like so successful that the Dvorak layout of the keyboard was banned from the competitions. They were not allowed to, to use that. <laughs> now, the record still stands from the Dvorak layout of the keyboard, which was established in the 1940s. 212 words per minute at the burst speed, and then for sustained uh, rhythm, 150 words per minute over a 50 minutes period. That's pretty amazing. Probably would do one word a minute, I don't know. So, he then he said, well, I need to commercialize this, right? Because this is a big, uh, big improvement to what we have. So what he did, he worked with Remington to create his typewriter with this specific keyboard layout. Now, what do you think happened? First of all, the typewriter was silent. There was no the typical click clack that people were used to. And the typists disliked that a lot. They wanted to hear, to have that confirmation that, that the hammer really hit, hit the paper there. And Despite the fact that it was much faster, it was never, never took off. It was never adopted. And again, you may hear now, if you look around, Dora keyboard is available, or you can actually customize your QWERTY keyboard to, to, to have the equivalent one if you're trained and you're proficient in that. But imagine you go to clinic, you want to take your keyboard with you, or, or you're going to have to reprogram the, the key. I mean, there is actually a very easy setting that you can change, but again, you have to be very proficient uh, in one or the other. But interesting enough, this never panned out, right? So let's go back to the essence of innovation. We're talking about diffusion of innovation. What is an innovation? Um, so Rogers defines it as an idea, a practice, or an object that is perceived as new by the individual or the adopting unit, or the unit of adoption. The newness of an innovation does not always have to be new knowledge. It may be expressed in terms of knowledge, persuasion, or a decision to adopt. And, and to me, this is like goes right away in my mind. Think about the touch screen of the cell phone. That was a new, not a new thing when Apple adopted. It was there, but it was never the right time to have that advantage. Not to mention that maybe similar to the click clack of the type uh, of the typers, the typewriters, um, people complain that, oh, I'm not gonna have that feel that I used to have with the Blackberry, right? So, so there, for various reasons, something can be actually just adopt, adapted and only then to be adopted. Um, a communication channel is actually the, the way to, you have to convey the message about the innovation from one member to another one. And that's extremely important part. And then in which social system you're trying to spread that innovation is another important part. And I mentioned time. So it could be that you may want to scale up or to adopt an innovation over a very short period of time or a much longer period of time. Um, Rogers makes this from the first edition of his book, this uh, interesting analysis, where he says, for some reason, we are used to the fact that innovations are typically technological uh, in nature, but it doesn't have to be. I don't know why we're using these as synonyms. Nowadays, we're going for technology for either hardware, which still dominates, but now we're seeing more and more software as a service, software as a device that, that are becoming the innovation that is, that is uh, descending. Now, what are the attributes of an innovation? So on one hand, what's the relative advantage? What is the convenience? What is the compatibility? Is it more complex or it's simpler? So again, keyboard versus touchscreen. Uh, can I trial it? Can I, can I see how it works? 
Uh, can I observe it while somebody else is using? These are different features that Rogers mentioned that are important. Um, he mentions when, so Rogers was at the same place where the corn seed, the hybrid corn seed, initially the uh, diffusion studies were done, and we'll go in a few slides through those, but um, he was at the same place in Iowa, and he was interviewing during his PhD farmers, and was asking them about herbicide and insecticides, and during one interview, he didn't really know how to code the answers of some of the farmers who was using those, those chemicals, but he devised his own sprayer. So in the end, he said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to codify this user as a user, this farmer as a user, but it was really a different mechanism he came up with. So this was, he called reinvention. What in the implementation science world would be adaptation. But the term reinvention kind of permeated from him. And he also describes that the communication between different subjects in the communication channel can have similarities, they, they can share certain attributes such as uh, set of beliefs, uh, education, socioeconomic status, and they, if they are similar, this is homophily, they're very different, that's it, um, So he does mention that if you're looking at the diffusion of innovation, the heterophily of the participants is a very important feature. And that's typically one major barrier for scaling up or adopting an innovation. Um, for example, it, it talks about change agents. Do you have a question? Uh, so he talks about how change agents, but I think this uh, relates also to experts, teachers, people who talk to, to their clients, um, they are technically competent and they may actually speak a different language and that may constitute part of the heterophily where the clients, the receptor may actually not understand specifically, even when, when that change agent actually talks about the specific attributes of the innovation, it says, oh, this is gonna make your life easier. Well, not necessarily if the individual doesn't speak the same language and doesn't perceive those. And, and also we need to think about how innovations may have consequences. Some of them are desirable. Some of them are, are not desirable, undesirable. Some of them may be very clearly directly related, but some of them may be mediated, may be indirect. And then there are some anticipated and unanticipated uh, consequences. Um, so, We'll talk a little bit more about this, but this is an important concept, which is the opinion leadership, uh, how and that influences the adoption of innovation. Uh, opinion leadership is the degree to which an individual is able to influence informally other individuals' attitudes or behaviors in the desired way with a specific frequency. So leadership is actually important from the point of view of opinions, right? Uh, when, when you're trying to influence in the specific channel over a period of time a social system. Um, Rogers defines a change agent as an individual who attempts to influence clients' innovation decision process in a direction that is deemed desirable by a change agency. When, when he talks about innovation decision process, he says, this is the innovation. You have to look at the attributes of the innovation. And then you look at the entire process by which that innovation leads to a decision to adopt. And he also talks about AIDS, which is maybe less than fully professional change agent, but that person intensely contacts clients and influences their innovation decision process. And he talks about four types, and why I said three, three there, I, actually, I think I do know. He says there are three main ones and maybe one that is emerging and that one was the last one listed there. So the, the, the four major innovation decision processes, one is the optional. So 2007, Apple, Apple iPhone comes out, you have the option of buying or not buying, you like it or you don't, you don't have to. That's an optional innovation decision process. Um, collective innovation decision process. We're all gonna use Encore Financial starting tomorrow. Sorry, sorry about the example. Um, that's a collective one, right? Or there's an authority driven type of innovation decision. Somebody says from tomorrow, we're gonna to start using Epic in clinics and there's no other option. And contingent is actually, we're gonna start using this innovation, maybe an app 
but you need to have the Apple phone first. So it's contingent on whether adopting another innovation first. So I mentioned a little bit earlier. <clears throat> Sorry, can I go can I sure. go this slide one second? Sure. I mean, it seems like there's another, well, I'll just say one of the things that happens here is that there, there's an authoritative system and it seems sort of contingent or something like that also. It, the, the system says, we're gonna try it and see if it works. And if it doesn't, we're gonna pull it again. Uh, so we're gonna try a certain dictating thing or it's a certain software, a certain screen. There's tons of software that they try. Um, you know, it's sort of like an innovation. Um, but then the, 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 it's not like the we, the grunts on the, on the, on the front, <laughs> uh, you know, clinical workers decide to use it or not use it. it the, the person who has found the innovation told us to use the innovation from right. the top says, okay, we're pulling innovation. It's, it's, it's either at some level, it, the cost effectiveness ratio is not good. Right. Well, so it goes back to the concepts of adaptation. So to what extent, maybe you're trying to say, we're gonna use this new electronic health system, record system starting tomorrow, but everybody hates it. And 25%, 26% of people will say, no way. This is slowing me down. It's gonna take me two, I'm not a good typer. I'm just gonna use the paper. And, and that's allowed as an option, as a backup. And you're resisting actively. Now, it goes also to the concept of the implementation where you say, well, we tried this, this was a complete failure. This is not something that uh, is helping us from any of the attributes mentioned. Uh, we should just pull it out, uh, pull it off. And then what do you replace it with? It's an important key question. And how do you engage people to actually adopt that new, new change? Uh, so these were the features of the innovation I mentioned earlier. So the relative advantage, and again, looking from the eyes of the user, of the adopter, is it compatible with what they have, what they have to deal with? Is it too complex? Is it easy? Um, can I try it? And is it observable that in fact, it does make my life easier or my fatigue from the legs go away? So I thought I would go back to the the concept of diffusion of innovation research and see where did it start? And it turns out it started in Europe with the French lawyer, Gabriel Tard. And he was a very smart individual. He noticed that the attitudes and behaviors of people in court were influenced by the different sets of norms and beliefs that were very common in society at that time. And he was able to use those in his favor and win more than others. So he ended up in 1903 writing a book called The Laws of Imitation. And its declared goal was to learn why, given 100 different innovations conceived at the same time, innovations in the form of words, mythological ideas, industrial processes, etc., 10 will spread abroad while 90 will be forgotten. Isn't that interesting? He realized that in his own practice, he noted that the imitation and Rogers makes a, makes a, a, a comment about this and saying that this, he was talking actually about adoption, uh, but he called it imitation. Um, he noted, and I'll give you another quote from him, that the adoption curves were S-shaped. And he also had the interesting observation to note that adoption curve at the early inflection point driven by leadership. If somebody mandated, somebody said, we have to do this, that was the earliest phase where the, the speed of adoption went faster. Um, he described that the diffusion of innovations was a basic, so the diffusion of innovation was a basic and fundamental explanation of human behavior change. He said, invention and imitation are, as we know, the elementary social acts. And this is the, la the latest, uh, the last edition of his book uh, that he published in 1969. And I thought this was such a great uh, description of the adoption curve. I told you it was described by, by Rogers. It turns out it was actually described before. A slow advance in the beginning, followed by rapid and uniformly accelerated progress, followed again by progress that continues to slacken until it finally stops. These are the three ages of invention. If taken as a guide by the statistician and by sociologists, they would save many illusions. I thought this was brilliant. 
So What's the S? You, you said an S shape, so there's rapid adoption, and then it, it goes below the curve. Mean, means means they reject that. No, it goes it goes from almost zero adoption, and there is an inflection point, and it goes very fast, and then it kind of there is another inflection point, and then the adoption rate goes slower, and then it actually stays there. Right? Mm -hmm. If you look at the cumulative, it goes S shape. In a way, otherwise, if you just look at absolute frequencies, it could be the bell shape. But the cumulated curve is actually shape, is shape. And I probably should have should have taken a, a, fig, a figure from his book, from Roger's book, where he shows different inventions how they start faster, others they go slower at first, but they actually achieve much higher rate of adoption later. And I found even a lawyer said a statistician should embrace this type of concept. <laughs> In Germany, there was another philosopher and sociologist, and he was actually seen as an academic in sociology, early sociology, uh, Georg Simmel, Simmel uh, who was teaching at the University of Berlin. And he introduced the concept of stranger, the friend in Germany, which he defined as an individual who is a member of the system, but not strongly attached to it. So he gave this definition in 1908. And later scholars actually capitalized on that concept and they used it uh, to define concepts such as social distance, heterophily, cosmopolitanness, and the idea that social distance research should really be based on objective measures. Um, so I think this is an important part of, of Zimal's contribution, which was coming up with communication networks. In other words, an individual is connected to other individuals in their uh, family life and their professional life, and they create these communication networks. And that may be an important way for one innovator to, to actually spread the innovation in the social system. And he says, the innovator as a type of stranger can more easily deviate from the norms of the system by being the first to adopt new ideas. I thought it was kind of interesting that he defined innovators as 2.5% of the strangers. They were not too attached to the social norms and the behaviors of the, of the larger groups. And then in Europe, there is another period of about two decades where there were two groups, the British diffusionists and the German-Austrian diffusionists. They were mainly anthropologists and they really came up with the term diffusion and kind of permeated the, the, the literature after that. And their central tenet really of anthropology was that social change in a given society is the result of the introduction of innovations spread from one original source only. So this kind of uh, argued against the idea of parallel innovation, which nowadays we modify that and think it happens at times. Um, the revised dominant view after the British and the German Austrian diffusionists was that social change is the combination of the matrix between the innovation and how you diffuse that in the, in the society, in the social system, and they typically occur sequentially, not concomitantly. So now back to the Iowa farmers. So I was telling you about the federal government was trying to spur adoption of innovation in the realm of, of uh, hybrid corn seeds. So that started out in 1928. And it was really a revolutionary agricultural technology because it did increase the crop productivity by 20, 25%, but also versus the open pollinated corn, but also provided more disease and drought resistance to the, to the crops. Apparently. Now, interestingly enough, this hybrid seed corn would not be very productive the next year. So the farmers had to buy it every year and that created a big level of resistance because farmers said, I, I have big crop every year. I can put aside something for my seed for next year. Why should I do it? So interestingly enough, uh, at that time, because of the existing funding uh, pipelines, uh, Bryce Ryan comes from Harvard to Iowa State University. He hires Neil, Neil C. Gross to be his research assistant. And they look and interview hundreds of farmers across Iowa. They go at 6 a.m. in the morning to catch them before they go to the, to the, to the fields and, and provide questionnaires and then look at what are the specific barriers of adopting a new technology or new innovation like, or new innovation like, like the, the hybrid core. Um, and they published in 1943, really the most influential diffusion studies of all time. This is the most quoted paper in the field of diffusion. Um, 
Now, what I'm telling you in the next couple of bullets is uh, really about how the field of diffusion of innovation uh, evolved in the 1940s and 1950s in the United States. It was really initially driven by rural sociologists and then to some general sociologists and anthropologists. Um, but it started out really with what was the main emphasis or the main priority for the government to make sure everybody is fed and the adoption of the newest uh, innovations in agriculture are actually permeating the environment. Um, so there were a, group, a few groups of rural sociologists who started to publish in this field, and, but they became so influential that most of the other people were following their leads and they were actually capitalizing on the concepts and the research findings that were published by their group. So what, what Rogers describes, I think brilliantly, is that they created these research traditions. If you're a scholar in research in this field, and you went against the grain with these, uh, you know, major enclaves. You're dead. You have to be, you know, kind of aligning with their paradigms. But this is how it actually evolved in the United States and worldwide: anthropology, early sociology, rural sociology, and then in education. Interestingly enough, people started to look at what's the best way of teaching children in schools, and started some educational projects on how do you diffuse those innovations: public health, medical sociology. And then, of course, communication and marketing became very big, uh, general sociology and other traditions. So shifting gears with another example, which is closer to us. This is about the Columbia University drug diffusion study. And three sociologists from Columbia University are the actors of these examples. Um, Charles Pfizer and company, at that time already a big pharmaceutical company, comes to them at Columbia and says, we're going to give you a big grant, $40,000, you're a sociologist, and you tell us if it's worth spending the money in advertising to physicians in medical journals about our new product that we have. It's called tetracycline. That was the era when about five or six antibiotics came over five years, and it was a big revolution. I mean, you can start you know, curing infections. Um, so it was released in 1953, but they were curious how to make the adoption better. So these three people came up with an interesting concept. They said, well, we need to do a pilot study first. So they went in, uh, in a New England town, found 33 physicians and interviewed them. If you had a new antibiotic, would you use it? What would be the attributes of that new antibiotic? Have you used other antibiotics? Now, they didn't tell them this was sponsored by Pfizer and the drug was tetracycline. But they said this drug is called gamma min. And we're interested to see what other antibiotics you prescribed in the last few years and why do you think they are better than others? And then once they finished the pilot, which they published in 54, they went ahead and did the main pilot, the main study, and they chose four cities in Illinois. They interviewed 125 physicians who were their target to see what are their beliefs and their practices about prescribing antibiotics. And then they asked them if they were other physicians who were considered for influential for them. In other words, who do you look up to? If you prescribe antibiotics, do you ever consult with another physician? What do you think about this? So they identified in those four uh, towns in Illinois, 103 more doctors, and they went and interviewed them also with network partners. And this became one of the most influential studies in early um, medicine uh, diffusion studies they found that the networks are extremely important. They found that the early adopters were those who were going more often to national conferences uh, and they were more up to date with the literature and the innovations being published. And, and they came back to Pfizer and said, yeah, definitely you should invest, you should spend money in, in advertising in medical journals because this is gonna lead to the early phases of the adoption. Uh, one important lesson, was that interpersonal diffusion networks matter a lot. And that became an important paradigm in the field of marketing. And again, they described that the adoption curve was S-shaped. There were at least two inflection points, and then you had periods where it actually plateaued. I thought I would give you another interesting example, which is uh, probably resonating with, with today's days. Um, this is about the diffusion of electric vehicles. And the story starts in the early 90s when two states, California and Arizona, 
their governments and legislatures said, well, our seas are too polluted. We need to come up with a mandate for the car manufacturers to make cars that are not polluting, either electric or hybrid. So they, they did that. They said that at least 10% of the car sales have to be within five years, electric or, or, or hybrid. General Motors, he said, oh, we have a great opportunity. We want to frame ourselves as a very innovative company in the minds of the United States public. So we're gonna invest in research and development to come up with an electric car. So they invested $2 billion in designing, manufacturing and marketing electric cars. And they came up with an electric car prototype, they called it Impact, had to be plugged into a 220 volt outlet for at least three hours, if not four, for fully charged. Very light and silent, no clacking, no humming, aerodynamic and with powerful pickup with a maximum of 100 miles range. They made 150 prototypes and with the diffusion scholars input, because they did some studies, they sent these 150 cars to 18 cities in Arizona and California. This was their prototype called Impact. They're very nice, shiny red color. So what they did very brilliantly, just now interviewing the diffusion scholars, they said, what should we do? They, they devised this campaign of advertising in the newspapers where they said, if you're interested in test driving this car, you should apply. And the application process was filling long questionnaires that were going through what they were beliefs, what they was degree of opinion leadership, how open they were to innovation. And they really selected the ones that actually they thought they would be an early adopters based on those questionnaires. And they were, so out of thousands of people who overnight applied, they had to select a few hundred and provided the 30 minutes test drive of the impact. So the marketing specialists call these folks mavens, in late terms, carnets. At their appointments, they wanted to know every technical detail about the new electric car. And they were provided 30 minutes after the test drive to ask questions. And the typical complaint was, this is not enough time. I had more questions. Uh, can I have more time to ask my additional questions? So after that, they were debriefed by a marketer researcher. And they were given eight by 10 color photographs of the red shiny impact. And they were urged to post it at their workplace or in a public place. And they also received 50 two by three inch color cards with a red impact car on one side. And on the flip side, it was actually detailed performance of their prototype. A lot of these mavens went back and said, I need another set of 50. I need another, another set of 50. I would buy one is the car coming up. So from the interviews with the Mavens, they asked about the name of the car and they said, impact is a terrible name. We don't like it. We think this is a problem. Why? Because this is a very light car and in a collision with a larger car, this would be a disaster. So please change the name. So they changed it to EV1, they call it. And then the next models were EV2, EV3 and so forth. They found out that commuters and soccer moms were very concerned about the max 100 mile range. We call that nowadays range anxiety, I guess, although it's not 100 miles anymore. And of course the 220 volt charging station was a significant limitation. Um, but they all said, sign me up. I want to be on a waiting list. When the first car comes out, I want to buy it. And they were asked what attributes were important for their adoption and they listed non-polluting quality, low cost of electricity, the nice appearance, the design they liked, and the fact that that conferred them some status of adopting some early innovation. So what happened in 1997, GM was able to produce enough EV1s that went on sale. They sent them to dozens of Saturn dealerships in Los Angeles, San Diego, and Phoenix, the same three, uh, two states. What do you think happened? People didn't want to buy that. And the two states were actually forced to postpone their original mandates for at least 10% of electric cars. Um, and after that, they, the interest in electric cars plummeted and then the hybrid cars started to be produced by the large manufacturers and that actually perked up much better. Now, they poured about $2 billion in that research and development, that was a lot of money. Uh, so it didn't come cheaply, but they did gain some significant insights about diffusion of innovation, which they used very successfully when their 
on the table new innovation, which was the global positioning system, GPS, was to be adopted and put on board in the GM cars. So it went very well this time. So what are the typical criticism of, of, uh, of diffusion research? One, and Rogers makes this assumption, very, very this statement very clearly that every field, every scientific field deals with a set of simplifying assumptions. And the reality is typically more complex. And if you're not making those assumptions very clear, you already have significant bias in there. The second one is that there is a prejudice of research training, which is actually a trained incapacity. The more we know about how to do certain things, the harder it is for us to learn how to do it different. So it's kind of interesting. It goes to the times of the agriculture innovation research. Um, there is a pro-innovation bias. So a lot of researchers in the diffusion research field say that a lot of times we go and say, well, this is new. We have to adopt it because it's superior. This is like the gas refrigerator. We have to. But there is some bias against those who say, no, I don't think this is good or this is not adding or is not compatible or we don't think this is clear. And because of this pro-innovation bias where we're trying to improve the innovation adoption curve, there is this specific bias that you should be taking into consideration because sometimes there is a reason why an adoption is actually very slow or, or uh, plateauing very early. Um, so, so in the field, uh, people recognize that you have to study a little bit the ignorance about innovations and how the rejection or discontinuation of innovation can be uh, predicted or prevented or minimized. Um, the antidote to the pro-innovation bias is one, not to be surprised at the end of the study to analyze the data and say, oh, too bad now, we wish we did it otherwise, or we will not have called it impact, but if you want, um, how do you do actually study upfront different strategies? So instead of saying, this is the strategy, we're gonna get limes for everybody on the ship and then this is gonna do well, why don't you do limes and then uh, lemons and see which one is better? Um, and what it gets into the implementation science field now is that you have to analyze the inner and the outside context, and you have to do motivation and interviewing and question your adopters and the resistors. Um, another important bias in the field is the individual blame bias. And what this just opposes the system versus the individual. And when you try to study the adoption, you actually tend to blame the individual. You say, well, these are laggers, these are resistors. And I'm giving you that an example. Somebody comes very enthusiastic about a new EPIC module that is designed to improve practitioner's life, but it only adds 10 extra clicks and four additional minutes of that time. That, that should be fine, right? Not always. Uh, so yeah, avoid uh, blaming the laggards and try to find out why non-adoption is happening. Um, and there is, of course, recall bias. A lot of these studies are based on interviews that happened with some specific uh, time lag, and that could be a problem. Um, you want to be as objective and as an immediacy is important. Um, of course, we tend to make this uh, mistake many times in research. Causality is not always established. A lot of times it's just association. And there's also equity bias, such as social ecological determinants of health can actually contribute to different rates of adoption in different social groups. So you may wonder towards the end here, why am I talking about diffusion of innovation again? Well, really because it's the grandparent, if you want, if not the parent of what we call today dissemination and implementation or implementation science. And what would be, before I give you three quotes here about how do we define implementation science, what would be the major differences between them? It took me a while too, so it's not it's not uh, obvious, but oh, if, almost hmm. in in much of our discussion, not a lot, but much of our discussion of the fusion of innovation is almost a passive process. It's the passiveness of getting it to the adopters and spreading the adoption. Yeah. We've talked about implementation science. We've talked about change management, maturity models, and structured change and structured adoption. Right. 
And that's a very valid point. And a lot of scholars are saying, well, the fusion of innovation is a little bit too passive. You're just looking at the gradient of innovation and you just assume that it's going to cross the barrier. It doesn't always happen. Um, I would point out another important distinction is when you talk about the fusion of innovation, you come up with something new and you're trying to make it adopt. But is it right? When we talk about implementation science, we say we, we're dealing with evidence-based practices, or at least evidence-informed practices, and we're trying to get those adopted. So I'll give you a few examples that actually juxtapose those specific points. Implementation science is the application and integration of research evidence into practice and policy. Uh, another definition says implementation science is applied research that aims to develop the critical evidence base that informs the effective, sustained, and embedded adoption of interventions by health systems and communities. I think now the juxtaposition here is one talks about doing the practice. How do you apply and scale up? And the other one is how do you research? How do you study what's the best intervention? Because there is implementation science practice, implementation science research. Um, I think this is kind of similar. It goes to how do you scale up? How do you apply specific uh, answers that you gain from your study into uh, health research policies, programs, and individual practices? And the current NCI, National Cancer Institute, and NIH is the definition is implementation studies, the study of methods to promote the adoption and integration of the evidence-based practices, interventions, or policies into routine healthcare and public health settings to improve the impact on population health. So I'll stop right here. I know it was a little bit dry, but I thought this was an important kind of journey through time. And hopefully I gave you some examples that resonated with you in your uh, field and we're open for questions. I love the slide that you ended on because I am kind of having this philosophical conundrum recently with translational science versus translational research, aren't we all right now? Right. And I kind of like this where it's, you know, we're busy trying to do something translational, right? Versus studying the method by which we are trying to accomplish it. And now I feel like the evolution of that slide marched in the same direction. Yep. Was yep. that intentional? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so can, can we maybe, maybe discuss that a little bit? Like is yeah. the field changing to now where we aren't just trying it on for size. We're not just trying to do actions to create some sort of momentum. Now we're we'll studying the manner in which we do the actions also mm -hmm. in the implementation science. Right. Okay. So is, so is where the I'm act is the act still implementation science though? Like this is this is where this is where I'm starting to question. It like are the doers still doing the implementation <laughs> science, or is it just the now we have to study the way the doers are doing things, and then does that become a separately labeled entity with a new vocabulary word? Like, are, are we marching away from our vocabulary? Yeah, I would simplify it in the following way we have evidence that we develop during research. And we say we have to adopt that, we have to scale that up. It's an evidence-based practice or evidence-informed practice that or intervention that we would want to apply in clinical care. And the simple act of how do you do that is the translation and science part of the implementation science and how do we scale it up. In, in, there are a lot of similarities with QI world, right? Where you have a team that is trying to say, what are the best strategies? Let's try to do this. Let's, let's uh, adopt this in our group. And then you have to scale it up and then you deal with different barriers, different contexts, different strategies, right? So, but that's the first part, the first interpretation. The second one is, how do you know how to scale up that new discovery? How do you know it's the best way? And that's where it becomes like, can you do a randomized study? And it becomes part of, this is research. And it has to inform, to, to be scientific about it that, we do it not because we found that worked in that setting. We assume that it's going to work in the same setting, applying the exact same methodology. At some point, you're going to say, is there a trade-off between fidelity and adaptation for us to be successful? And is the degree of adaptation going to be uniform across units, or is it going to be different? 
But to me, it still goes from simple act of implementing it to how do you know which one is best where you start doing, we have to analyze what is the, the methodology that works best. Does that answer your question? Okay. I think, yes, I mean, when, to, to the latter part of your statement, you know, we have to be able to understand which of the processes will help disseminate our findings or, you know, get them into practice with that. The science of determining which of those practices is still the implementation scientist or the translation of scientists. Right? Right. I still think for, for a lot of us in this research world, um, we're not going to be doing the science part. We're going to be using the science part. Right, because how are you going to build a career if you're in, you know, Department of Orthopedics and you're studying bone growth? Um, you're not going to make a career describing the dissemination of information in a general term. You know, you're going to use those tools to disseminate your new technique for joint replacement, and whatever it, whatever it is. Right, it's very difficult to establish a academic career as pure. Translational scientists. Yeah, and I have joined different groups of implementation science, and I discover some research traditions, and I discover that some people are actually completely blinded by the practice part of things versus oh, we need to submit another grant and study this strategy and forget about the practice part, right? Which is like you have a new discovery or a new innovation that you want to scale up in clinic. And that's the practice part that there's no really cookbook for that, right? So any other questions from the Zoom world? Not seeing anything. I'm seeing here, but I'm not seeing questions. <laughs> <laughs> Automatic overwrite muting function going on. I mean, that's have you, have you silenced everyone? I don't think so. Maybe unmute everybody. <laughs> unmute, start calling names. Yes. Alex, are you using the Dvorak uh, keyboard? <laughs> Picking on people. I sure am. Um, I was actually typing in chat, so maybe I'm not fast enough. Um, I'm sorry to have missed the start of of the presentation today. Um, without, I mean, I mean, I'm trying to ask this honestly rather than polemically. But to what extent is implementation science really um, a social science as opposed to a physical science, and how do we maybe end up with biases or confusions based upon you know a background and training? You know, like in physical bench, biological science versus dealing with all these people and they're difficult. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, I know the answer to that question. And, well, and in terms of just how to think about it, you know, in terms of it being a science, but it being reproducible, or it just, again, it just feels to me like trying to do real implementation science, we're just wading into a very, very variable and hard to repeat field. Or hard to replicate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, that's where I, I think we are with that journey in defining translation of science for our own environment, where we realize that we need competencies from very different fields, uh, marketing, public health, sociologists, psychologists, I don't know, but there are so many fields even from social realm and not necessarily from the biology realm that can actually be healthy. Um, because we're often even in the team science in our ensembles, while we do approach it in a as multidisciplinary fashion as possible, we still have some of those biases that I mentioned because we come from pretty much the same type of environment. Um, 
that, that's why I find very refreshing to, to hear opinions of people who do not work in healthcare, who interact or consult with businesses in healthcare. And they have very good insights. They say, well, you guys are, are not uh, considering something or you're ignoring something else or your methodology is very different or it's not generalizable. Um, it goes, to, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, healthcare associated infections, it's a big problem. Uh, we use a lot of antibiotics, a lot of use antivirals in the hospitals. And so we select different multi-resistant drugs. And we noticed that uh, ventilator associated pneumonia, healthcare associated pneumonia with staph aureus, for, for example, that is multi-drug resistant, it's a problem. So somebody came with the exact opposite of what the principles of translational science is in an organization that is national, VA, where they said, oh, we should, we should uh, screen anybody who is hospitalized um, to see if they are colonized in the nose with MRSA. And if they are, we should be treating them with some gel that is, includes antibacterial agents. Without any randomized study to say, this is cost-effective, useful, leading to reduction in, in, the, in the hospital infection rates. And that's a national policy. So you're talking about implementing with opinion leadership, mandatory decision diffusion, um, not based on scientific rigor. You cannot take it back now, right? You cannot control the rates of the same bug from 10 years ago. So how do you de-implement de de something like that? It's almost impossible. So you have to be very scientific when, when you come up with a new policy, a new decision like that, that that's one adaptable or you can de-implement, right? So if you knew what were the better, so, so when I mentioned this example to George Easton from business school, he said, you guys are doing exactly opposite of how everybody else will be doing. Because if they identify the specific nosocomial infection, the first thing they would take cultures from everywhere to see where is it coming from? Maybe it's from the dust in the corner of the ICU room and you're blaming the nurse that they didn't clean their hands. Well, it makes sense, but you didn't prove it. <laughs> so yeah, we're, uh, sometimes we have those specific, very deep biases, and that's why I wanted to go through the, some of those biases and do the future research. How do you untrain ourselves from the old way of doing? Well, I don't know if Alex is still on. Alex, aren't you in the uh, bias where you always blame the end user as being incompetent because of the <laughs> racist? Um, <laughs> But I think the one thing what Alex brought about was, you know, all the variables you, you brought up that diffusion is based upon the cultural norms of the group. But what's the smallest unit of that, right? I mean, you know, if you're talking about getting patients to eat this diet instead of that diet, right? What communities, what groups of patients, what age groups, what, you know, what geographic locations, I mean, it, it the units get smaller and smaller. True, but I would counter just for the contrarian's point of view there, which is if you look at adoption curves and change management, all you need is you need to identify stakeholders who are willing to adopt. It doesn't matter who right. they are. I identify them, the same as GM provided questionnaires that actually selected the main ones who would be uh, very enthusiastic and, and use their networks to diffuse it, right? So just yeah. find the initial 20% and then it's gonna go up to 80. And I bet you're gonna to have to use a different strategy to go from 80 to 100 right. versus what you have to do from 10, zero to 15%. And I would argue if GM redid the same thing, they would choose a different group of <laughs> influencers, right. right? They chose the real technocrat right. car mavens right. who may not be what you would want to, um, to right. get people to adapt. And, and to give you another example that's from the same field, this is where Porsche got it completely wrong when they came up with their first SUV. And the Mavas, the Porsche Mavas said, well, I'm not going to drive a Porsche anymore. anymore. I'm going to sell my, my uh, uh, $200,000 car with, uh, vintage because this is treason. And guess what? They didn't do the diffusion studies before, the marketing studies before, the soccer moms loved it. 
And it was their savior. Otherwise, the camera would have gone broke if they didn't have the SUV, which was completely against the Mavens, right? So it goes back to, do you really have to rely on the same category of adopters or are you going to continue to produce or to design for the same group? Right. And you, and you don't know a priori maybe who the adopter is going to be. I mean, I always think of a CB radio. I mean, it came out as an easy way for anybody to communicate. You didn't need your telephone, you know, you could, but why is it so pervasive among truckers? Right. right. And, and they still use it. They still use it today, even with cell phones. Yeah. Right. But nobody else adopted it, yeah. even though the communication, the ease is there. Yeah. But, but in my, so, so we're missing that in healthcare, right? Because I mentioned this example before you go to a supermarket and the fact that Coca Cola products are on a specific shelf, it's the result of a randomized study that they do. And they ask people who walk into the, you know, what would you like to buy? Well, I don't want to buy vegetables, well, but this is the ones that are perishable and is the highest margin. Let's put these in front, <laughs> right. right? So, but you have to, to do the randomized evaluation of who are your stakeholders, what are the barriers, what are the facilitating factors, and then kind of devise your marketing strategy. That's why I, I think marketing people are very useful from that point of view. But we don't see, we, we don't see marketing for medicine always what they are. They do research, they look at, Beliefs, they look at how do you change uh, perceptions? How do you um, provide a certain image of the attributes of a product and you go through the four P's and so forth, not only price. Um, and they, then they say, we have this segment that we're going to be customizing. We cannot just customize it for everyone. Right? How much do you think the issue in healthcare is one of the points you brought up on the slide, which said that, um, I can't remember the exact quote, but it was... Uh, if there's something you know a lot about doing really well, it's harder for you to change, right? right? Yeah. So when you take physicians and, and nurse practitioners and all the practitioners, right. you're being trained to do this thing really well. And then all of a sudden you're being asked to change, right? right? Um, <laughs> it's more, it's, it's, it's beyond inertia, right? Right. It's just like, I don't, see how if I'm doing I don't know, cross country skiing, how to get the skis out of those tracks and don't stay in those tracks because I know otherwise it's going to be problematic, right? Right. Any final comments, questions from the Zoom world? If not, thank you so much. It was a, hopefully a useful session and see you next time. <laughs>